<laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. We will start in a few minutes. I see people are joining, so welcome. Hello, and thanks for joining us to talk about global expansion during COVID-19. We will give it another minute, minute and a half, just to ensure that we have more people, because you're joining and joining and joining. So. Um, We'll let you come in. Good afternoon. I see Ariel, Ayelet, Elena, Guy, Tali, Shira, and more and more people are joining us. All right. So we'll start and um, Okay, so I hope you see us uh, here, of course, on Zoom and also uh, probably on Facebook. And welcome uh, and thanks for joining us for Global Expansion during COVID-19 webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about challenges and opportunities around this um, interesting time and how it's affected um, the world of mobility and global expansion for uh, tech startups um, that are working in the global arena. Um, Basically, as you know, the new normal, as everybody likes to call uh, this era, is actually being shaped, um, you know, in front of our eyes, and I call it global growth spurt. Um, this situation actually um, ha um, ensures or, uh, sorry, enforce startups to change in order to survive, in order to um, add different technological uh, means to be more efficient, to work remotely, and I'm sure you see it uh, on a daily basis. So we're having, we're experiencing a new reality that actually is changing in front of our eyes every single day, and there is a lot of uncertainty. And we will try to give a bit of certainty in this webinar, because as we can see, everything is connected, is in interconnected, you know, different companies um, that have, it's like a domino effect. So when um, investors uh, stopping their, stops their investment to different companies, um, companies changing um, its behavior, they're trying to be more efficient, they, they're closing their, their money uh, tap and trying to um, reduce employees or, you know, change the way they, um, they sell, the way they market, changing their product and so on. This is, of course, has a direct impact on employees that work in different um, continent or different countries uh, when it comes to finding visas, to immigration, to employees that were in different processes of moving to a new country, of coming back and so on. So in this webinar, we're going to talk about uh, global companies and how they're um, actually coping with the immigration issues, with the mobility issues. And um, for that, I'm very excited uh, uh, to have this a team of experts with me, which uh, will introduce themselves uh, in a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about immigration aspects, relocation and repatriation, uh, global business development, and of course, have a case study by Monday. So um, before we start, I invite you to write um, different questions on the Q&A uh, button here. And um, yeah, I think it's time to introduce our amazing panelists and start getting into the actual uh, meat of this webinar. So um, Jennifer, please start, introduce. Hi, thanks, Ron, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, so my name is Jennifer Shear. I'm the founding partner of Shear Immigration Law Firm. We're a boutique US immigration law firm based in Tel Aviv. Um, we work mainly with high tech companies and the VC community. Uh, we have wonderful, uh, amazing startup companies, uh, including Monday, uh, which we're very happy to have join us today. Um, I'm also a uh, uh, advisory partner at Angular Ventures, uh, early seed venture venture capital firm, and I'm active in the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Thank you. We'll move on to Daniel. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm the Client Services Director at Ocean. Ocean is a family-owned uh, business, and I'm third generation in the company. 
we provide relocation solutions to support both individuals and uh, companies. My background is legal. I'm a lawyer as well. And Shiran. Hi, I'm Shiran. I'm Monday's general counsel. Uh, Monday's um, uh, work operating uh, system for uh, to manage your work, your teams. It's cloud based, and it's a great company. <laughs> that yeah, and, and we're going to actually start with you in just a second uh, to really understand how you Monday coped with this uh, uh, this whole uh, few months where the world has changed uh, upside down. Um, I am Liron Glickman. I'm um, the moderator and I'm the business uh, development consultant, owner at The Human Factor. And um, we'll move back um, to you, Shiran. So please share, share a bit of an overview. So how Monday um, that has different um, representation in different countries around the world, how did you uh, cope with the effect of the COVID-19? Sure. Uh, so first I'll start uh, by saying that uh, I was kind of uh, one of the last employees that uh, came back from uh, abroad. It was uh, like the last week of February. I came back from New York and a week thereafter we stopped all flights among um, uh, between the company sites. At a time we had a site in New York and a site in uh, Israel. And obviously you can imagine that we had a lot of elf flights between, but we stopped everything when we started uh, understanding that they're probably an issue and it probably risking our employees and it's not required. Um, so we started each one working at its own um, site. Um, for, for the one hand, it is really quite significant because we're used to going around uh, the sites, but from the other hand, in any case, we are all working on Monday. We are working on the cloud. We are co collaborating. We are. We can even work from home. We can work from everywhere. Um, so it's not. It, it didn't affect our work at all, uh, which is a good thing. And a, a one week, two weeks thereafter, we we started to work really work from home, which was. It was probably more challenging to companies that are not used to it. Um, we are as a high tech company and a company that using, we are all centered on the platform itself on Monday, it's a cloud based. So we are, we just continue working business as usual. Um, although it can create uh, some uh, FOMO, fear of missing out to employees. You know, we don't have lunch together. You don't have coffee breaks, you don't meet people. Um, so one of the things we really uh, did in this area is just to bring stability where instability he hits. So we, we as the leadership um, of the company, we sent a letter to our entire uh, employees and telling them that this is a challenging period. We want everyone to work from home. And we also provided some benefits like loans, sick days. We had workshops. Uh, we had a lot of lectures, um, happy packages every week and, and stuff like that. Happy hours, beer night. We, had, uh, we have a legacy of uh, beer night every two weeks. So we maintained it um, over Zoom, which was kind of great. Um, and we learned how to keep our routines, even though we are all uh, distant. So we gave our employees some sort of stability um, when they knew they can trust us. We, they knew we trust them. We kept our goals uh, and our goals uh, are quite ambitious, um, even, even more so in COVID-19 period. Uh, I can give you, for example, one of our goals, apart from our uh, annual revenues that didn't change, we keep our goal as is. Um, one of our goals is really to, was to grow from 320 employees to more than 700 globally. Um, so we, we, we are on a path, we're even <laughs> exiting this path um, because there are a lot of talents in the market that, that uh, it was this, uh, it was kind of unfortunate for them to be released for companies that didn't, that couldn't uh, keep them. Uh, but we were there to recruit them. 
Um, and, and we even opened some more sites um, in San Francisco, in Miami, in London, and in Australia during COVID-19. So we had a few challenges there, um, but we were flexible enough to allow it. Um, for instance, we had a relocation to an employee to open the site in London, but since we couldn't get a visa, uh, we still can't get the visa because he's still waiting. Um, in London, in Australia, we're still waiting for the, uh, for the embassy to start the process. Uh, so he started recruiting remotely, his employees in London. Uh, we did the same in San Francisco. We wanted to relocate an employee from Israel to San Francisco, but uh, we are, our schedules, uh, Jennifer knows that, uh, at, the, at the U.S. Embassy got canceled three times. So the visa got delayed, uh, but he started recruiting uh, remotely, and we didn't give up the goal to build those sites. So we actually opened four sites during... Wow. Uh, COVID-19 and we're going to continue this uh, growth during the, this period when we go back uh, to normal. Um, I think that uh, by not changing our goals, we actually gave stability to our employees as well as to our customers that they know that they have the same goal to reach out to, even though we told them we trust them. We know that they're with kids. We know it's going to be challenging time. We don't expect the same productivity, but eventually we got there uh, and even more than expected. Um, so we really feel fortunate that we did it. For sure. What you're saying here is definitely um, like I haven't heard of, of other companies that have opened a few sites during these uh, last few months. And obviously, um, as you say, you, you found the right methodology, the right people, and, and took good care of your people, which is obviously the most important thing. And that's also what, what we're going to talk about today. Can you share um, maybe one um, major challenge and how you were able to, um, um, to solve it? Like you mentioned about the people that found the way to hire people, but obviously some teams work remotely and the visas and so on. There's any uh, one tip that our listeners can learn from your experience here? Yeah, so so we really around the, the the people hiring the people. For instance, one of the challenges was okay, interviews can be done remotely, but what are we doing with uh, R and D? Um, one of the the steps in the in the interviews is to to have an exam with actually coding. And they have to be here to, with a computer. So we found, um, I, think, I think it's an Israeli startup, but I'm not sure. But we found a, um, a, a web-based program that actually allows doing interviews for, uh, for R&D people and do the code over the system. So it solved our problem. It was a, quite a challenge. And the second is really the relocation issue. Um, People here, you know, they pack their staff. They're already, they are, they were prepared uh, for a certain day to leave their homes, to leave their stuff, to close their bank accounts, to just move out, and then everything just stopped. It just yeah. stopped, and and they knew it's going to be delayed, but they don't know when, and they already rented their apartment to someone else. So it's actually challenging. So we had talked with the people and 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 helping mm -hmm. them ad hoc because we wanted to reduce their concerns eventually and to keep them, you know, in a good shape and starting uh, um, uh, solving those, uh, those problems in order to really proceed. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm taking two main um, lessons from what you just shared. One, as, as we said earlier, is really taking care of, the, of your people, making them feel secured. And the other thing is use more technology to solve other tech um, always again yeah you sure. yeah so the technology is out there um, and that's a great good message for so many people that maybe you can find different tools that you haven't heard of and this could definitely help you throughout yeah. this time thank you so we're going to come back to you um, later in this webinar to learn more about how you pivoted and, and what did you do with your uh, product and and of course their uh, customers and so on uh, i would like to move on to jennifer shear uh, for she from sheer immigration 
And could you share a bit more about the trends around immigration? So many people are now maybe unsure about their visas or how to uh, apply for a visa, or if they're already in, in a certain process of getting a green card or, or a work permit. There's so many questions around this. So please share the, the trends of these past days or weeks. Sure. Um, well, first of all, just a, a general note about immigration to the U.S. in general, and that's something that, um, before I get into uh, the trends that I'm seeing with Israeli high-tech companies, immigration to the U.S. in general is down. It's decreased significantly um, for reasons that um, Shiran, some of which that Shiran mentioned, um, the travel restrictions, the various quarantine restrictions, um, embassy closures, the inability to actually apply for a visa. So just generally, um, immigration to the U.S. is down. Uh, it's expected to be approximately down by 61% um, by through the end of September. And this is really, really significant because USCIS, which is U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, the Immigration Service in the U.S., is fund-based. So when people submit applications, that's how they're, they're getting their funding. So at, at present, um, because of the lack of funding, they're asking Congress for a bailout of $1.2 billion dollars right now. So why, why does this all matter to us? Um, they're expecting a furlough of about 11,000 employees with the Immigration Service, so that's going to affect companies because it's going to take, with less employees, it's just going to take longer and longer and longer to get your applications approved, whereas the backlogs and the processing times are, are really, really long as it is. Um, so just as a side note, expect a significant increase in the, in the filing fees. Uh, need to be paid to USCIS because they need to somehow be able to, to pay their bills as well. Um, in terms of uh, the trends that we're seeing with our clients, with, with high-tech clients, we've seen since the beginning of COVID um, and until just, I would say, maybe the last week or so, um, a significant decrease in new relocations. Okay, so we're not talking about people that are already in the U.S. and need extensions and, and so on and so forth. Um, actually, um, the, new, the new relocations, where we are opening a presence in the United States and we need to send our, our founder there. Um, obviously, that's, again, a result of the restrictions, um, the problems in actually getting the visas. But I also think that it's a result of the slowdown of, of VC funding. I, I really do, because the less VC funding we have, um, teams that, and I've heard this directly from different clients in various industries, and I also think that it's it's kind of industry specific, um, but you know the shift from sales and marketing, which is typically what's going on in the United States, and more of a focus on R and D um, because of all of these you know complications um, around getting people to the United States. Uh, obviously, there's a decrease in business trips. Just you know you need to send somebody over for a quick business trip to meet with an investor or or meet with um, you know a client for sales. There aren't any face-to-face -face meetings, so that's like just a, a logistical thing. Less business trips. Also, if a person doesn't have a valid visa and the embassy is closed, they can't get their visa. Um, so we're, right now, we're seeing things starting to pick up um, as the restrictions in Israel specifically ease. Um, we're seeing companies wanting to uh, venture into the U.S. market and set up uh, set up their presence there. So they're initiating new visa processes for founders and and other other key personnel. But it's been kind of like a trickling process. Like we haven't, we didn't hear a thing from March until early May and now suddenly they're starting to trickle in. Um, another really interesting trend uh, during the, the COVID period is the increase in employment-based green cards. Um, we're seeing a lot of companies who have employees already relocated to the United States. They're already there on uh, various types of work visas um, and they wanna keep them there permanently. It's either by request of the employee themselves or, or by the company because this is somebody who's really important. And because of all of this uncertainty um, and also changes in the rules and regulations, which we'll get to uh, when we talk about the challenges, um, a whole lot of a really a mass of, of green card applications. So that's, that's uh, an, an interesting trend. I think that also just not knowing what's going on. What if USCIS stops accepting applications altogether? We want to kind of get our place in line uh, right away. Um, and also, I think that that's also a result of the availability of um, the EB-1. It's a certain employment-based green card that's popular amongst multinational managers and executives and people of extraordinary ability. Um, it's current for May and June. That means you can actually submit an application 
and change your status in the United States while you're in the United States from work visa to green card holder. It's a long process, but it's, it's, uh, it's a time sensitive thing and the window needs to be open. And it was open luckily during May and June. Um, so we're seeing more, more of those as mm -hmm. late. You know, I remember uh, before uh, a day or two ago, we talked uh, about this webinar and you mentioned that uh, obviously the, the, um, the laws and legislations around the immigration are changing by the day. So whatever you say today may, you know, change in, in a certain way tomorrow in a few days. But this is, I would say, one of the challenges here. If you want to share a few more challenges that we're experiencing these days. Okay, so just um, something kind of, before I get into the, the legal stuff and the, and the, you know, the executive pros and so on and so forth. Um, I think one of the main challenges for, for companies during this period is the fact that, um, you know, people are working remotely. So I'll just give you kind of like a, a real life uh, scenario here, and in, including our office. So USCIS, the immigration authorities, is, is still operating like they're in like 1955. They're old school. We have to submit like paperwork like this. I don't think anyone really knows what goes into putting a petition together, um, but they have not, they've eased uh, certain requirements such as being able to submit not original signatures, no docu-scan, but you can sign um, and we can submit uh, paperwork and, and petitions with um, scans or fax copies of wet signatures. But there are other things that in this process that they, they have not changed. So for example, in addition to having to submit a ton of paperwork, we also need to submit hard copy photos of people. Um, you know, we need to, I, I don't know, like actually give physical checks and order them from a bank. So imagine you're a tech company operating in Israel during this period of time and you want to send someone to the U.S. So you even want to pre-plan it, okay? Do it now um, while it's quiet. So you need to be in touch with a bank in Israel, get your checks for your filing fees, bring them over to Syria Immigration, have someone actually leave their house during a period when they're not supposed to be leaving their house, um, send us digital photos that we have to go have printed out at the printing place. So this is, these are all, it's it sounds kind of like, you know, technical stuff, but it's really, really hard um, for companies to, to, to maneuver this logistically um, during that period. Again, now things are starting to, he's in Israel, so that's starting to change, um, thankfully. Um, but that was, that, was a big, that was a big, huge challenge. And if restrictions go back, I expect that to be the case again. Um, another thing and is the constantly changing, as you mentioned, Leron, the rules and regulations. Um, on April 22nd, uh, 2020, uh, Trump came out with this wonderful executive order that caused a whole lot of panic, a lot of phone calls. Um, you know, does this apply to us? Does this not apply to us? Basically, it limits um, certain intending immigrants who are outside of the United States waiting for immigrant visas or, or green cards um, uh, to, they're, they're the ones who are affected by this. It really didn't affect anyone who's under the traditional widely utilized uh, work visas that, you know, that we all know of, the H's and the L's and the E's. But nobody, it was very, very, un, it was very, very unclear. Um, so this executive order is effective for 60 days. Most of our folks were not affected, but we need to see how that plays out. So in the same executive order, and this is the part that actually, this scares me, okay? Um, it said that L visas, H visas, O1s, E1s, and E2s, these non-immigrant visa programs are going to be um, reviewed within 30 days of the executive order, which is just now passed. So this is like cooking now. Um, to consider appropriate measures to stimulate the U.S. economy and ensure, and I'm quoting this, uh, prioritization and hiring and employment of U.S. workers. So I don't want to speculate now as to what exactly that means. There are some, you know, hints uh, out there and rumors and things like that, but I can say pretty confidently to expect changes with the work visa process and limitations and restrictions that will impact on tech companies. Um, stay tuned. I hope it's not that bad, but, um, you know, just, Buckle up because it's coming. Um, and I just think that, you know, just generally as a general thing, all of this together is really discouraging investment in the United States. I mean, COVID is not something that can be controlled, but putting limitations, um, extra limitations on top of an already difficult situation is certainly not helping matters. And of course, we all know that tech companies, Israeli tech companies, are creating jobs in the United States for U.S. citizens. So one would think they would, they would ease up on that, but so far under this administration, notwithstanding COVID, that has not been the case. Yeah, well, let's hope for uh, not such bad news, right? Let's hope that they will uh, we'll make a better decision around well, it. 
Um, and um, I want to ask you, I think one of the most um, common questions um, that I also received when I talked about this webinar beforehand is how can one apply uh, in the US Embassy in Tel Aviv? And what about um, other countries? I mean, can I uh, apply to the US through other countries or other visas if I have or passports? Right. So, um, well, the short answer is you can't apply, but there's, there's, some, uh, there's some exceptions. So, um, as of March 16, 2020, all routine um, U.S. visa services uh, at, at embassies worldwide um, were suspended. Okay, so there's, you know, um, emergency appointments available, but the criteria are very, very strict. Um, you need to check uh, specific information per country on the Department of State website. Um, but that being said, um, the U.S. Embassy um, in Jerusalem and the branch office in Tel Aviv just announced last week that certain people uh, seeking to extend their visas are, uh, they will qualify for um, a waiver of the interview. So that means you can actually, you have to um, send in your passport and then they'll issue the visa. But this is a process, it's not an automatic thing. You need to actually get into the embassy's um, interview scheduling system and then put in your details and then, the, then the, the system will prompt you if you're eligible for an interview waiver. So that's, that's good news and that's, that's very recent. Um, can't hear. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, oh, are the, yeah, now you can hear me. So is the U.S. Embassy uh, accepting E2 or E1 visas at the moment? Unfortunately, they are not um, until further notice. Um, just a little brief background on what E visas are. Um, E1 visas are for treaty traders and E2 visas for treaty investors. The E2 is, is kind of brand new for Israelis, so it's super um, of interest to Israeli companies right now. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just quote you, as of March 16th, we, we emailed the embassy and they said that we are, you know, closed um, and not, not accepting any applications or evaluating any e, uh, visa applications for the moment. So that's kind of bad news because that's, that's kind of a total freeze um, on, on, on e-visas, which are highly, you know, they're very widely utilized amongst uh, startups. Yeah. And another, another question uh, before we move to uh, Daniel's, uh, also um, about the... Um, um, his, his point, um, how can one, uh, can, can people file for other visas, work visas, for example, the L1, H1, O1, uh, we talked about the E2, or employment-based green card uh, for people, U.S. Uh, immigration services? Yes, uh, thankfully, even uh, during um, the, the, you know, the hardcore beginning, middle of uh, COVID, COVID period, uh, USCIS, I was accepting uh, petitions for non-immigrant and immigrant visas, uh, which is really, really good news. However, they did suspend premium processing service um, until just a few days ago, which was terrible news for Israeli companies because they're in a big huge hurry. So premium processing means you basically submit another uh, $1,440 um, uh, check to them and they will process your application within 15 days. So all the Israeli companies are on a huge hurry so everyone wants premium processing. In fact, I don't think I've had in the past 15 years more than a handful of, of companies who didn't want premium processing. So as of today, actually, they're phasing back in premium processing, um, you know, in, in, in different phases. Uh, today, they're starting to accept them for certain types of green card petitions. Um, and June 8th, they're going to start accepting further ones. But the bottom line is, uh, to cut to the chase, as of June 22nd, all the regular visa types will be able to submit their petitions via premium processing. So that's, that's super good news. That's good news. So June, you said June 22nd. June 22nd? Uh, 22nd. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's that's the good news for us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, just, one other, just one other note. Um, another thing that USCIS, because of COVID, uh, suspended all uh, in-person services. So they're planning to reopen on June 4th. Um, the in-person services are things that, um, you know, affect all different kinds of immigration benefits. Um, they do biometrics. Uh, for example, they do employment-based green card interviews at these field offices. So they're expected to open uh, as of June 4th. But again, I'm putting a, a star next to that because we don't know, as Tiran said, you know, the embassy canceled three, four times. And, you know, and closures can also be extended. So we're, we're, we're hoping for the best on that as well. Yeah, let's hope for the best. Uh, it's changing by the day, as you said earlier. 
Okay, thank you. Now we're moving to Daniel Dranger. Um, I want to hear from you about relocation and repatriation, which also uh, happens uh, through the COVID-19. So please tell us about the trends and about the challenges of these uh, times. Okay, so just to explain, I mean, as a relocation company, we basically oversee the entire process of re relocation. So um, it starts from from obviously consulting about the relocation package itself and the compensation, going to immigration and all the remaining services. So we, it's really about supporting A to Z, the client and, and the employee. So um, as, as Jennifer just described, I mean, everything is changing on a daily basis. <clears throat> and the only thing we know for sure is what we are all experiencing right now. So just to give a short recap of what we are seeing here at Ocean, um, so again, strict border restrictions, entrance only to citizens, two-week quarantine upon arrival. For many companies, relocation per se is on hold, not canceled. Repatriation, on the other hand, has grown. We have seen more and more individuals acting on their desire to be home during this difficult period and be close to their families. We have also seen that many employees have returned home and are now stuck in their home country. In other words, they are not returning to their country of work. Um, so, I mean, if, if, I, if I, you know, highlight a few of the challenges, I think that one of the main challenges for companies and global HR departments is keeping up to date and informed. Um, new laws and regulations, travel bans, embassy closures, immigration changes, shelter in place, orders, temporary business shutdowns, pay cuts, termination sometimes, this has really created a, a pandemic, you know, related chaos around the world. And as a relocation company, it is our responsibility to see to it that everyone involved is kept as up to date as possible and keep the chaos to uh, a minimum. Um, moving on, I think that, you know, nobody can escape the financial challenge of budgeting for the new normal. So, for example, international shipping companies have reported increased shipping rates, often due to availability uh, of cargo flights and surcharges to accommodate social distancing and safety of the workers and the employees. Um, we anticipate changes in housing needs, so longer temporary housing bookings for um, employees that hasn't been able to find their home. And sometimes the need for more space because of working, uh, moving to work from home. So we had clients approaching us for home switches for their employees. Um, we also receive requests for additional support uh, for employees who require just additional services, such as um, assistance with online ordering of food and supplies during the lockdowns and quarantine. Um, another challenge, is uh, remote workers that stuck in their in a country that is not their designated country of employment. So tax for them becomes a key element to consider, evaluate and address. Uh, and I know that many companies and our clients included are currently reviewing taxes and social security implications uh, of, su of, of, of such a, of such a, a case. Um, now, in light of these challenges, um, you know, companies are rethinking and reevaluating their relocation policies. Um, and they're also redefining their workforce and workspace. Who works in the office? Who works remotely? What does working remotely actually mean? Um, we've all heard about, you know, companies announcing changes of work policy until the end of the year and, and for some companies until 2021. Um, so, this, this is, you know, I think the main thing I could say in terms of trends and challenges from our business. And um, I have to ask, what do you see more through the COVID-19, more relocation or more repatriation? So at this specific moment, we are seeing an increase of uh, expat departures to their home countries, mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes within 24 hours notice because of, you know, uh, low availability of passengers' flights. Um, the majority of Corona time relocations uh, had been put on hold, but not canceled. So just as um, Shiran just explained, I mean, things are continuing, but are on hold in different phases. And obviously this will change once the travel bans are lifted again. 
Yeah, because you know, different country and you work in, you work all around the world and different countries has different restrictions. So obviously Israel is now hopefully in the other side while US and England has other, um, they're in other conditions right now, they're more restricted. So when it comes to companies and how they decide to manage their um, expats, what are the key considerations for them in regards to relocating or repatriating employees? So I think, I think that, uh, I'm, I mean, we're seeing two main area, uh, areas of consideration. The first is the increased focus on corporate duty of care, which is the attention to the well-being and safety of relocated employees. And just to make sure we are all on the same page here, duty of care is something that always existed, but has become more critical during this time. Um, now, the focus of duty of care is it's preparing and being prepared for the unexpected. So at the very basic, it includes ensuring employees know how to deal with illness, accidents, personal and family security, preparing employees and help them understand the financial implications of their move, including tax consequences, and ensuring that employees are aware of possible immigration changes that could impact their assignment and so on. It is given that, I mean, relocation uh, in this new normal would be more unsettling for the employees as well as for the company. So duty of care is a, is a big area that we are focusing on. Now, the second consideration is actually an opportunity uh, for companies to restructure relocation packages to meet the new needs of their employees. And in the Israeli market, we are seeing companies uh, moving from lump sum benefits, which are, in other words, relocation grants, allowances, to more managed and defined services, such as a local lifeline. So this allows you know, the employee to really navigate changing local restrictions and settle more um, efficiently. Yeah, because, you know, you also mentioned that uh, as part of your uh, responsibility, you also help people with online and grocery shopping and, and really the little things, the little, the most important, but let's say the small actions that are, are vital for, for people, let alone in, in a foreign country. Um, and, and I would like to know how are companies in this sense providing more mobility to support the employee during COVID-19 through the countries or obviously within the country? Yeah. So, I mean, I think Sharon mentioned this as well. I mean, you know, the fact that they are being more attentive to employees' needs and, you know, understanding that they are currently um, in a very um, delicate situation of uncertainty. So they will be um, looking, you know, re-looking at, you know, what they would like to provide for the employees. And we have, of course, adapted our services to reflect the needs and responsibilities of duty of care. So some of the new additional services that we now provide um, include, um, you know, the ongoing ongoing COVID-19 support uh, to ensure, you know, information is, is shared in a relevant and timely manner with the employees. Um, quarantine uh, assistant package, with, which includes a telephone hotline and, and sourcing local delivery options, as you mentioned. We also do property management for employees who are not currently at their assigned country who had to relocate, um, you know, to, you know, back to their home country and they're currently, um, their house, which they have secured for their assignment is currently empty. So we, we take over uh, the lease and help them manage, you know, um, their property. And um, another, th another, another request we had is about on-site move management. So our local consultants, consultants are attending packing and deliveries of household goods shipments on behalf of the employees that are currently uh, away. Um, so, so we, again, and, and this, you know, we are seeing, you know, different requests and we really try to um, adapt and, and uh, do you know, the best we, that we can, I mean, to provide this support. And may I ask if you can give us like a quick overview about different countries? I mean, probably the popular countries that Israeli companies have offices in, if there's any specific tips or restrictions or that you can share with us? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, uh, I mean you have to be patient. And I think that um, what I'm you know, telling uh, employees is that everything will fall into a place eventually. So sometimes, you know, at this point, they, for them, it's about how am I going to secure a house and the shipping and the tax and their, you know, cats relocation. 
And I'm just trying to um, structure the timeline for them so they understand better what they need to do at every phase. I mean, sometimes it's, it's best to say, there is nothing you need to do at this point. We need uh, to wait to, and see how things unfold, especially around immigration. I mean, um, the fact that, you know, interviews are being canceled over and over again. I mean, there's nothing you can do about this. I mean, you can be frustrated as much as you want, but um, it's, it's, you know, it's like Koachelion. So, I mean, there's nothing you can do. And so it's a lot about, you know, setting expectations with the employees and their um, HR and get company support to, 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 you know, to whatever recommendation that we have um, to deliver the services. And, and, um, yeah. and we are being constantly in touch, you know, with, with, with our customers about every changes. I mean, we currently have people stuck here in Israel waiting for, you know, to relocate to China and waiting to relocate to the UK and to the US and the rest of the world. And every, everyone is in different states. So we are, it has become like, uh, kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, I mean, of, of what's happening in our, in our company at the moment with people all around the world. So it actually takes me to the sentence you started with, which actually trying to create certainty in a very uncertain situation, each person, each company, each country with its own challenges. And that's, exactly. a, that's a very important role. Um, thank you. Now, I invite you also, um, our listeners here to to um, send us questions. You see the Q&A bar here on Zoom or on Facebook. Uh, just write the questions and we'll address them soon. Um, I wanna zoom out for a second and kind of show you, we talked about the situation around the world with different industries, uh, but I want to show this, um, this kind of map about potential winners or potential losers. So each of the startups that are here with us, um, listening to us, I'm sure you're either catering one or a few of these sectors or um, involved in, in some of those. And it's interesting really to see how um, in terms of potential winners, obviously the basic uh, companies who have worked in or working in the basic uh, needed, most needed um, sectors actually gained or win one but gain from this situation so of course medical supply services food processing and retail personal health care um, information and uh, communication technologies and e-commerce obviously agriculture oil and gas education financial service they needed to actually adapt more and as they say some of them really needed to to change overnight uh, towards more online and more um, availability for the clients and obviously the rest through because of quarantine, because of uh, obviously social distancing and all kind of um, and needs and restrictions are now really in a phase where they're in a minimum uh, operation or unfortunately some uh, have been shut down. So I'm sure you have uh, been working or work with some of those. If we take um, Monday, for example, so um, you're actually are kind of cross sectors. So you can address a lot of uh, different sectors. And this is where I want to go back to you, Shiran, and kind of understand um, from you what was um, the, any product change that you have created? Uh, how did you find your clients in the different sectors uh, throughout the past few months? Yeah, sure. So remember when we talked about the letter we provided to our employees in order to give them stability? So we actually wanted to do the same thing for our customers to give them some sort of stability, to create start, uh, trust between us. So we also drafted a letter to our uh, customer base. Mm -hmm. And in order to, to share with them that uh, uh, this is a, a, a journey that we are all facing now, um, but we, all, we even told them how much money we have in the bank um, and, and told them what we are going to do about it, what we're doing with the situation, how we manage things, what are, what is our, what are our challenges? So once we shared with them, we gave them, we created some sort of transparency with them. So in order to create trust and in order to let them know we are here for you and you can trust us. Um, so this is the first thing we did. And the second is really open the platform to NGOs fighting COVID-19. So university took advantage of it, hospitals um, around the globe actually. So they're actually using Monday um, as, as a platform to, to develop things, to, to 
um, manager projects, uh, all related to COVID-19. Um, one of the things we also did is we were the, the platform that actually centralized everything within the control um, center of the Israeli government. Uh, it was the Israeli Hamal um, that worked on, that actually combined a lot of minis Israeli ministries and all worked on Monday. Uh, it was based in uh, Tel Shomer. Um, in order to really um, centralize all, for instance, test results, um, bringing um, contribution, by the way, and bringing equipment from, from around the, the globe. We had, they manage when the flights are coming in, when they're going out, uh, what it, which equipment, when is it going? It was a huge effort. And everything, everything was centralized. And it was kind of amazing to see because there's a real challenge in collaborating between the Israeli government ministries. It was quite challenging because they're all working in their own environment. And then to combine them all, it was a real challenge that we were able to overcome. It was a great uh, case study that we also published. And in general, since we are a platform and we, we really talk with every, every um, industry you just described and more, um, we created, we worked very intensively on, on working on to provide solutions and templates uh, to our customers to enable them to work from home. Uh, we know that the best thing that worked for us, for us and this is the actually the basis that without it we could not succeed is the transparency because when the company is transparent and employees can see everything everyone can see everything so they are all very well connected to the entire chain so they can take decisions they can they can be empowered to do their job and and take real ownership and do things you know people here developed apps and did hackathons they, they didn't ask anyone, they just did it. And we get great result out of it. And we created like a package for any customer for, to work from home, manage their work from home to with dashboards, with their employment resource allocation, with an integration to Zoom, integration to Slack, a lot of tools that people are working uh, and also gave them, we, we managed our blog. We did a lot of webinars with in, uh, powerful tips and, uh, and training on how to work from home and to share really our knowledge. For us, it's the day-to-day, -day, but for them, it's like the new norm. It's the new routine. So this is where you say your day-to-day -day actually came very handy for, for, for account clients. Um, and I want to I wanna address, thank you so much, Iran. Um, I want to address a question uh, by Beth Cohen. She's asking, Daniel, um, has anything positive co-achieved uh, out of this emergency situation? Um, yes, I mean, of, I mean of, of course, I mean, we are trying to look, you know, at the whole thing um, from a positive, you know, perspective and, and, and really get out the best out of this. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, being resilient is, is really helpful, I mean, to deal with the situation. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, what I've mentioned earlier about, you know, uh, adjusting to what is now called the new normal um, and dealing with, you know, uncertainty um, and, and reminding, you know, ourselves the importance of having a duty of care strategy as well as a contingency plan uh, in place. Uh, something that I think that we overlooked um, for a while and required, you know, all of us, I mean, I mean, as, as a relocation company, but, you know, every company as itself, I mean, to look uh, again at what they're, you know, wanted to uh, at such time. And, and I think that at the end of the day, I mean, uh, relocation will continue. I mean, and, and critical talent will be relocated. So um, we just need to really, you know, just hold a bit. Thank you. And I want to address another question um, to you, Jennifer. Um, some people have, with, um, with a foreign uh, passport, they can enter the U.S. through the uh, ESTA, which is a visa, visa waiver program. And I, I personally know in a few, of, of a few cases 
the people that cannot uh, depart the states because of the situation and their 90 day period of visa is about to expire. Can they extend their stay in such case? Yes, uh, the answer is yes. There is a process for people who can show that they're in the United States and <laughs> show that it's you know, outside of, um, beyond their control, they are not able to leave the United States because of the COVID. Mm -hmm. um, there's a pretty relatively simple process called satisfactory departure. So you basically just, so Google um, CBP, um, Deferred Inspection, and you'll get a list, uh, an Excel sheet with all of the, the ports of entry to the United States and numbers for the offices that you need to call to CBP. You just call them up. You'll need some basic uh, details, your, when you, your I-94 card and your, and your passport with you. But generally, they've been very, very accommodating and extending people's uh, stay um, for at least 30 days to begin with. Um, if, again, 30 days is the starting point, but if you can't get out after that, um, I've seen cases where they're extending uh, for another 30 days beyond that. Um, I have a friend now who's in the United States. She's DC at a tech company, and she's watching now, and she's stuck uh, there, and she had to use this process. So we know that it works at least at JFK for sure. And another question, let's take it from the other side. So if and, uh, we have um, another attendee that is asking, uh, is, is there any option to get special authorization for experts um, to come into Israel? So, I mean, at this point you can still apply, I mean, for the work permit for the principal approval um, from the Ministry of Interior. And, I mean, and, and as well, I mean, you can, I mean, the whole process is a state-based process. So you can start um, with the application, but then in order to um, enter Israel, we need, you need to get special approvals um, from the ministry. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's uh, multiple ministries in full. So, uh, so, I mean, even if, I mean, once you book the flight, you need to go to the local Israeli consulate abroad and get the special approval. I mean, it's not something that I can say that works for everyone, but if you fill an essential role um, that contributes to the Israeli economy. I mean, companies like Intel and companies that support Intel, I mean, would probably be able to get those um, entry entries to Israel. But I, I wouldn't say that, you know, it's something that you can apply to all experts coming to Israel. But there is a route for that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, let's have a quick round of, of summary notes. Uh, you may also got different uh, questions or um, messages throughout this webinar, but I would love to kind of uh, hear from you what are the main tips or, or summary points that you want to share with our audience. Um, so uh, let's start uh, with you, Shailen. Okay. Um, <laughs> so one of the things really I've, I've learned during this process is to just understand what once you know we get to a lot of place in uncertainty and then to just hold the goal and go away around it in order to get, get to the goal forget about the way you knew the right way but there is no one way to get to the to the final goal so be flexible i mean there are always solution what you can do and always think on how you can you can have to make from this scenario that is quite imposed on you and this is not something we can control and to make it an opportunity i know it's like a cliche but this is really something something we did internally and externally and it, and it actually worked um so strongly suggest uh, to do that thank you so much jennifer so um, I think that my top tip, number one thing really is to is to check in with Immigration Council, whether it's my firm or another great immigration firm that you trust, because things are, are changing almost on a daily basis. Um, and so, and, and, and some of, sometimes these um, changes are extremely confusing for people. They don't make sense. The plain language of, of, let's say, the executive order that came out that week didn't make any sense. And it causes a lot of panic. A lot of times the panic is, is not warranted. Sometimes it is, but, it, but it's not always. So I think the, the number one thing um, in this period of time of uncertainty, again, where things are changing daily, is to check in um, and, and get the facts. Um, in terms of my tips for, for high tech companies right now um, during this period, I think that uh, the main thing is to really map out your corporate immigration needs to the extent possible, okay? So what does that mean? 
um, initiate relocations and short-term assignments as far in, in advance as possible. So this is something I, I, I said before COVID and I, and I stick to it, but, and I know it's hard planning wise now with all this uncertainty, but just try and, you know, if you foresee something happening in a few months, just, just map it out. Um, determine whether long-term permanent employment is necessary for any employees that are in, already in the United States. This is a key person. We need to keep them there. Should we file a green card or not? Um, that's something to, to start thinking about now. Um, check your general employee immigration status. Maintain internal records of people who have already relocated, their visa expiration dates, and their family status. For example, uh, do I have an employee in the United States who's whose spouse is dependent on having work authorization. A lot of, as Daniel knows very well, a lot of relocations uh, fall on the inability of a spouse uh, to work in the United States. So like, I'm, you know, I'm a founder and I'm relocating, but if my spouse can't work, then, then I'm not, you know, my relocation is off. Um, and at present, the processing times for um, extension of stay for accompanying family and EAD, employment authorization documents or work permits, uh, for accompanying spouses is extremely long right now. Um, so this is something that you need to have an Excel sheet at a minimum um, to see who you have, where they are, and what they need. Um, and finally, in terms of, of business trips, because, okay, business trips might be kind of off for the moment, but they're going to come back, okay? So now is the time when we don't have the pressure uh, internally in the company, any employees that you foresee having to to take a business trip to the United States, um, do they have a valid visa? If they don't, um, you know, can they apply under, you know, apply for extension of their visa under the, the embassy's interview uh, waiver uh, program at the moment? Um, if, if, you know, we can't get somebody over there that has a valid visa, do I have a U.S. citizen that can travel instead? Do I have an employee um, who has ESTA um, who can enter the United States for up to 90 days under the visa waiver program? So now is a really, really good time um, when things are just starting to ramp back up, to just examine the situation internally at your company um, and, and, and plan to the extent possible. Thank you so much. And Daniel? Um, I think it's, it's more of, you know, of what I've mentioned earlier, I mean, and what Jennifer just said. I mean, mapping out your needs, understanding, I mean, um, I mean, about current moves and pending move, what are the exactly requirements of each employee? What do you want to do as a company? How do you want to reimagine um, the, the, the support that you provide to the individual? Understand the risk and, and understand your duty of care as a company and what you need to do in order to uh, enable a smooth uh, process uh, for this uh, employee. I think that you know, looking at your relocation strategy is something that will be useful to do during this time. Um, I think a lot of companies, especially startup uh, companies, assume that um, relocation is a bonus, something that is very, you know, easy to do, um, even if you're a co-founder and even if you, you know, immigrated or oh, no, had a business trip to the U.S. multiple times, but it's actually a very stressful process. So uh, especially at this time, I mean, with the actual fear of each one of us, regardless of relocation of whether or not we would be, you know, um, sick with COVID or 19 and so on. So um, I think that um, greater emphasis and focus on what types of support you wanted to provide uh, to your employees. Thank you. And I will add that, um, you know, along with the, again, uncertainty and rules that are changing and countries that are always, you know, changing again, their, their restriction or their, their law and, and so on. Essentially, all of you talk here about uh, uh, the people, the people that are actually the, the companies that you guys are managing and moving them to help you expand the company. So obviously it's very important to put the right emphasis on them, to be open with them, to give them the right tool and transparency also as Shiran mentioned, um, and really try to add some certainty um, to their lives at the moment. And that of course will uh, come back to you uh, as a company and hopefully the skies and visas will open up soon for us all. Um, but again, I want to thank you so much, Jennifer Shear, Daniel Dranger, Shiran Nawi, and of course, Debbie Kendall, which uh, helped us on the behind the scene of this webinar. Um, my name is Liron Glickman, and you're welcome to contact us here or through LinkedIn. Um, I hope uh, everybody uh, enjoyed the webinar. Thank you, Aria. 
and uh, we'll be happy to uh, be in touch with you after that. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leon. Thank you.